Welcome back. In this lecture, <coughs> we'll cover special population, how we deal with them when it comes to perioperative pain management. This lecture is part of a series of five lectures designed to cover post-operative pain service. I would recommend you watch the lecture in, the, in this order. So, to start by talking about elderly. Elderly patients with dementia, those who are frail or both, are more likely to have their pain underestimated, which can result in adverse outcomes such as poor sleep, impaired cognition, increased disability, depression, and reduced quality of life. <clears throat> Postoperative delirium occur in about 10 to 60 percent of patients with a higher incidence in older patients. In patients with more advanced dementia or with significant postoperative delirium, observational measures of pain-related behavior should be initiated if the previously mentioned method have failed. It is important to know the patient's baseline cognitive function. Multiple studies show that the elderly have great likelihood of respiratory depression than younger patients. Other side effects of opioids seen in younger patients such as nausea, vomiting, and priorities are less common in elderly. This table summarizes some of the physiologic, pharmacodynamic, and pharmacokinetic changes that happen with ages. So let's go over this. Cardiac, it decreases cardiac output. This will lead to decreased sympathetic response following epidural spinal anesthesia. Decreased cardiac output can lead to higher peak arterial con con concentration of opioid after IV administration. Hepatic, decreased phase one metabolism, decreased blood flow, decreased liver mass, all of which lead to decreased hepatic metabolism of drugs with high extraction rate, like opioid and lidocaine. Renal, decreased glomerular filtration rate, decreased clearance, lead to increased plasma concentration of renally cleared medication like NSAIDs and metabolites like morphine. CNS, net loss of neuron, there's decreased conduction velocity through peripheral nervous system and increased sensitivity to local anesthetic with neuroaxial and peripheral nerve block. Muscular, decreased muscle mass and increased body fat. This will lead to increased volume of distribution of um, lipophilic drugs. Pulmonary, decreased respiratory center sensitivity, increased incidence of ventilatory depression with opioid, uh, and this by recommended uh, regional technique, we'll see. This table uh, summarizes some pharmacokinetic changes in elderly. So, um, as you see here, for lipophilic uh, uh, medication, as we saw from the previous slide, the volume of distribution usually increase. For hydrophilic, the volume of distribution usually decrease. When it comes to clearance, all medication have a decreased clearance. How this manifests, so duration of effect usually increase most of the time, except for the ketamine and NSAIDs. What does that mean? So you might have more frequent side effect, and you need to adjust the dose of this medication accordingly. The incidence of renal failure increase in the presence of pre-existing renal impairment 
low serum albumin level, hypovolemia, hypotension, and concomitant medication including insulin and diuretics or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor and other nephrotoxic agents. In elderly, the dose of non-selective enzymes should be reduced by 25 to 50%. And the dosing interval also should be increased. So non-selective enzymes are contraindicated in post-operative period if the estimated creatinine clearance is less than 50 ml per minute. So it's important to check the kidney function in every patient, but more so in elderly. Elderly patients are at greater risk of GI adverse effect, including ulcers, bleeding, and perforation. The risk of GI bleeding from the use of non-selective enzymes is approximately twice as high as in patients older than uh, 65 year olds. A reduced dose of opioid is generally recommended in elderly because of age-related changes in pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic. 50% reduction in clearance, a reduction in protein binding, and increased brain sensitivity to effect of opioid can be seen in older patients. Patient age rather than patient weight can be a better clinical predictor of postoperative opioid requirement, as there is an inverse relation between average opioid dose and age. Despite this, there remain significant inter-individual vari variation in opioid requirement in older patients. Therefore, opioid must be titrated for each patient to achieve adequate analgesia. Miberidine should be avoided in patients with renal impairment, as we know from the previous lecture, because it is metabolized, can result in significant nephrotoxicity. Reduce the dose of ketamine and make sure you turn the infusion at least 45 minutes before waking up the patient from anesthesia. Okay, let's shift gear now and talk about pediatrics. Children suffer from postoperative pain at least to the same extent as their adult counterparts, yet they often receive less analgesia. It is now well documented that neonates are born with ability to perceive pain as they have considerable maturation of the peripheral spinal and supraspinal afferent pain transmission neuronal pathway by 25 weeks of gestation. Studies in units have shown that pain, if left untreated, can lead to amplified physiologic or behavioral responses to future nexus events, as well as the development of chronic pain syndrome. Now, the tricky part in pediatric, how are we gonna assess pain? The appropriate assessment of pain in children is the first step in developing an effective pain management plan. Whenever possible, using a self-report method remains the gold standard for determining pain intensity. Older children, usually above seven, can use tools such as visual analog scale or numerical rating scale. Neonate infant and children younger than age of three or five or, or younger than seven, uh, those unable to communicate uh, are primarily assessed for pain via behavioral and observational pain assessment tool using the children uh, facial expression, limb and trunk motor responses, uh, verbal responses, uh, a combination of behavioral, physiologic, and autonomic uh, measures. There are a bunch of uh, tools. Uh, I'm going to show you a few of them. Here, for example, we have neonatal infant pain scale, neonatal pain agitation and sedation score, face, leg activity, cry, consolability, 
scale slack so this is uh, the visual scale as we all familiar with it can be shown uh, to the uh, kids uh, this is the neonatal infant pain scale uh, nips uh, can be used for children uh, below the age of one and uh, a score greater than three indicate uh, pain uh, as you will see it includes facial expression uh, uh, a crying uh, breathing pattern uh, arm movement leg movement and state of arousal and for each one you give score from 0 1 2 and you add them up uh, came up with the score here is another one the a neonatal facial score system. This is more simplified. Basically, you have four items, and for each one, you're going to score zero to one, yes or no. So, bro balls, eye squeeze, nasal labial furrow, open lips. You add them up. If they score two or more, that indicates significant pain and required analgesia this is the FLAC uh, which stands for uh, face leg activity cry consolability and you're going to give a score from 0 to 10 uh, 0 to 2 for each if the FLAC score greater than 3 consider intervention a score greater than five, it is necessary to increase analgesia. Would be nice to save such uh, a screen so you can use it. Here is another one for post-operative pain score for infants. Um, this is more lengthy. Similar concept, you give certain points to each uh, parameter. You add them up and you determine the need uh, for analgesia. Okay, the liver and kidney are the most important organ responsible for drug metabolism and clearance. Glomerular filtration rate is diminished in the first week of life, resulting in decreased drug clearance. Although new units are born with most of the hepatic enzyme intact, there is delayed maturation of enzyme system involved in drug conjugation. This affects a new unit's ability to conjugate most analgesics, including opioid and local anesthetics. The weight normalized clearance of several opioids is administered in units and reaches mature value over the first two to six months of life. Neonates and infants also have an immature ventilatory response to hypoxia, hypoxia making them vulnerable to airway obstruction, hypercapnia, and hypoxemia. The respiratory frequency failed to increase during hypoxia in infant. Thus, neonates Receiving opioids should be monitored by continuous pulse oximetry. This is a nice table summarize uh, many of the commonly used medication for pain management postoperatively, and it gives you the oral dose, the IV dose, with some comment. Again, it's a nice slide to save and use. Um, uh, as a cheat sheet, for example. This is another table specifically for PCA. Um, so the doses of morphine, fentanyl, and hydromorphone when it's used uh, um, in PCA, whether continuous infusion or not, boluses, maximum dose, etc. The FDA issued warning that tramadol should not be used to treat pain in all children younger than 12 years and in children younger than 18 years after the removal of tonsils and or adenoids. No such warning was given by the European agency. It's 
talk about neuroaxial block for kids. The most popular and useful neuroaxial block used in pediatric patients in the perioperative period is the single shot caudal block. This reliable, safe block is appropriate for surgical procedure below the level of umbilicus. The needle penetrates through the sacrococcygeal membrane, as we see here, into the sacral hiatus, into the epidural space. Caudaquina is infiltrated with local anesthetic. This table shows you the doses of local anesthetic, specifically here, lidocaine, bubivacaine, or rubivacaine when it's used for epidural or peripheral nerve block in pediatric. Non-pharmacological management. Children are very responsive to pain-reducing strategies that involve their imagination and sense of play. Therefore, the involvement of child life specialists, which is available in most of the big uh, institutes, who are trained in a myriad of non-pharmacologic te technique is essential in the preparation of children preoperatively as well as in their pain management postoperatively. Okay, now we're gonna talk about pregnancy. A critical period in pregnancy covers the first trimester with respect to potency of teratogenicity and the third trimester with respect to the influence on the newborn or the premature closure of the ductus arteriosus. Acetaminophen is generally considered a safe analgesic throughout pregnancy. NSAIDs inhibit synthesis of certain prostaglandins and those may have some degree uh, adverse effect, especially in the second half of the pregnancy. Although the results of clinical trials are non-conclusive, NSAIDs are not recommended in women planning to conceive and during the first trimester, as they may increase the risk of miscarriage, according to several studies. NSAIDs are contraindicated in the last two to three months before the expected delivery due date to the risk of premature closure of ductus arteriosus and pulmonary hypertension in the neonate. Codeine and tramadol are weak opioid analgesic commonly used for postoperative analgesia. They are not recommended shortly before delivery due to risk of respiratory depression in the neonate and a prolonged use in the prenatal period might incur the risk of withdrawal symptoms in newborn. Codeine is no more recommended during lactation. So it's not recommended during lactation. A fetal respiratory depression has been reported in infant who mother took analgesic containing codeine during lactation and belonged to a rare group that rapidly metabolized codeine to morphine. Remember the ultra metabolizer in the opioid lecture. Morphine is safe in terms of potential teratogenicity. Regarding its use, the same apply as codeine it can cause respiratory depression in infant. Mibiridine are also not recommended uh, because long-term administration lead to uh, neurobehavioral changes in infant. This is a nice infographic from the anesthesiology journal. Um, these are medication that you can proceed in the green light avoid medication uh, in red, mibiridine, and be careful with a medication in yellow, like morphine, hydromorphone, and ketamine. 
Okay, now let's talk about morbidly obese patient. The incidence of obesity is rising worldwide, and as recently as 2016, it was estimated to affect approximately 40% of the U.S. adult population and six, 650 million adults worldwide. Consequently, increasing number of patients with obesity and morbidly obese body mass index more than 40 are presenting for elective and emergency surgery with changes in perioperative acute pain management. Morbid obesity is associated with physiologic changes affecting multiple organs. The changes impact the pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic of commonly used perioperative medication. So let's go over organ by organ. Cardiovac uh, CNS, e increase sympathetic nervous system activity and cerebrovascular uh, disease. Cardiovascular, higher circulating blood volume, higher cardiac output, hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular hypertrophy, and core pulmonary. Hematologic, polycythemia and hypercoagulability, respiratory, decrease FRC and um, ERV, expiratory residual volume, increase oxygen consumption and CO2 production, increase minute ventilation, chronic hypoxia, atelectasis, OSA, OHS, obesity hypoventilation syndrome, restrictive lung disease, gastrointestinal, large gastric volume, lower gastric pH, gallbladder disease, NASH, cirrhosis, endocrine, higher insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, hypothyroidism, infertility, renal, glomerular hyperventilation, hyperfiltration, impaired naturesis, and musculoskeletal osteoarthritis. Patients with morbid obesity can experience opioid-induced ventilatory impairment with opioid-centric pain management strategies. This condition presents as sedation and respiratory depression attributed to opioid administration combined with upper airway obstruction and hypercapnia. If this remains undetected and or untreated, it can result in an increased perioperative morbidity and mortality. Some pharmacokinetic uh, changes, the volume of distribution of most analgesic drug is altered in uh, morbid obesity. This is partially due to the larger increase in adipose tissue in comparison with increase in lean body mass. Some pharmacodynamic changes with or without sleep disorder breathing and obstructive sleep apnea. This patient population is particularly sensitive to sedation and are at higher risk of um, opioid-induced ventilatory impairment. Those concomitant administration of benzo and opioid should be avoided in the perioperative period. In general, regional analgesia technique, when possible and appropriate, are recommended to minimize the use of opioid sedation, particularly in those with history of OSA. Patients with OSA are at increased risk of respiratory depression when opioid and sedative are administered. For a morbidly obese patient with OSA, it might be prudent to use local anesthetic without opioids for continuous epidural analgesia, although this decision depends on the individual patient surgery and epidural cover. The following table summarizes various uh, scalars that have been suggested for commonly used analgesic in patients with morbid obesity. 
So again, this is another slide that you might um, want to save as a cheat sheet when you are uh, trying to uh, calculate the dose uh, for different medication in this population. As you see, um, it's quite different uh, between medication when you think how you're going to dose uh, the medication for loading dose versus uh, infusion. Um, there are certain medications, for example, uh, acetaminophen, ketorolac, and tramadol, they really have a fixed dose. Now, there are certain medications, you uh, dose them uh, uh, by uh, total body weight or lean body weight or ideal body weight. Fundamental analgesics, and here we're talking about acetaminophen and NSAIDs, should be administered systematically in the absence of contraindication. This is a modified uh, analgesic uh, step later for morbid obesity patients. Uh, as you see uh, uh, on this side, uh, when it comes to antihypergesia adjacent, it should be considered on all patient. Um, and then based on the severity of the pain, so all, if not contraindicated, should get the acetaminophen and NSAIDs. And then based on that severity, you can give uh, opioids. And again, don't forget about the antihyperalgesia medication like pregabalin, lidocaine, and uh, ketamine. The use of ketamine is recommended when possible in morbidly obese patients since it's almost devoid of respiratory depression and sedation side effects when administered in subanesthetic doses. Lidocaine also is useful adjunct in acute perioperative pain. It has shown to prevent, uh, have a preventive analgesia properties across a variety of operation. IV lidocaine can also be employed as an alternative to neuroaxial or regional anesthesia for thoracic, abdominal, pelvic, or lower extremity surgery when these techniques are contraindicated or unsuccessful. Don't forget about education, reassurance, and setting realistic expectation. Um, overall, this help the pain management. Uh, this is a summary uh, table that summarized uh, some of the recommendations in the preoperative, intraoperative, and uh, postoperative. So preoperatively, um, screen for sleep disorder, screen for risk factors, uh, provide education, reassurance, start fundamental analgesics, as you mentioned. Intraoperatively, uh, try to use regional analgesia, multimodal, uh, opioid sparing, consider ketamine, lidocaine, dexmetomidine. Postoperatively, uh, extend, extended monitoring, uh, look for potential respiratory uh, adverse event, continue uh, stepwise opioid sparing, multimodal analgesia, consider anti uh, hyperalgesia and consider early referral to chronic pain specialists in cases of poorly controlled acute postoperative pain or pain crisis. Okay, well now let's shift gear and talk about patient with baseline uh, chronic pain and chronic opioid users. This is um, a recently uh, published paper found that uh, came up with some recommendation. Um, so the opioid dependent patient will require an individualized plan for postoperative pain control. Opioid requirement for these patient may be high and unpredictable because of opioid tolerance. When possible, a plan for postoperative pain management should be made in advance before surgery, including possible consultation with pain management specialists. So that paper published a consensus statement and recommendation. How do we categorize and define opioid use in the preoperative patient? Categorize patient as ONE, 
So you're going to go over the on it. Uh, defining opioid naive as no history of opioid use in 90 days before surgery. Defining opioid exposed as history of uh, taking opioid uh, but less than 60 milligram uh, morphine equivalent uh, within the past 90 days. And defining opioid tolerant as a history of uh, taking opioid uh, more than 60 milligram equivalent in the past um, seven days. How should patient be risk stratified preoperatively for opioid related adverse event and poor outcome? Um, the paper recommend using the ONET classification, which we will go over in a minute. So the ONET stands for opioid naive, exposed, tolerant classification system. Basically, what it says, um, you, the patient will be opioid naive if they didn't get any opioid in the past 90 days before surgery. The patient will be opioid exposed if they have any amount less than 60 milligram equivalent of morphine in the past 90 days before surgery. And the patient will be opioid tolerant if they have more than 60 milligram morphine equivalent within seven days of surgery. So O-net, opioid naive, exposed, and tolerant. Here is my um, cheat sheet for you from the opioid lecture to remind you how to convert different opioid to morphine equivalent. Okay, so based on that, based on the ONIT classification, now the risk will be uh, divided to low, moderate, and high risk of opioid-related adverse event and poor outcome. So if you are naive, if you are naive, then you belong to the low category, exposed to the moderate category, and tolerant to the high category. However, um, there is uh, extra risk modifiers here. So that's the risk modifiers here. You have psych factors like depression and anxiety, bipolar, substance factor, opioid use disorder, other use disorder, and surgery procedure associated with persistent pain. So if you don't have any of these modifiers for more than three months prior to surgery, you still belong in the low risk group. If you have a single modifier, even though you are opioid naive, you still belong, you, you will be belong to the moderate risk group. If you have, if you are tolerant, of course, and, or you are exposed, and you have one modifier, or you are naive, and you have more than or equal to modifier, then you belong to the high risk uh, group. Okay. How do we optimize moderate to high risk patient according to ONET criteria? Don't forget that's how we came up with the risk patient group. So moderate to high risk patient group according to ONET criteria, uh, it is recommended to start weaning opioid preoperatively to the lowest effective dose. Optimize management of psychosocial comorbidities before surgery. Individualize 
preoperative education to promote shared pain management expectations. Identification of and communication with patient out patient opioid prescriber to anticipate discharge need. Referral to a perioperative pain specialist before surgery for highest risk patient. What are strategies of perioperative pain management in moderate to high risk patient according to ONIT criteria? Individualized multimodal analgesia pain management strategy, including regional, neuroaxial, whenever appropriate. Is opioid-free intraoperative management feasible in moderate to high-risk patient according to ONIT criteria? The answer is yes. What are strategies for management of postoperative pain in moderate to high-risk patient according to ONIT criteria? One, routine use of non-opioid options as part of comprehensive multimodal analgesia perioperative analgesic plan. Use the lowest effective opioid dose in postoperative period. Avoid opioid dose escalation. Addition of opioids only in the setting of suboptimal analgesia after first line administration of non opioid options. Use of non pharmacological treatment of pain. What are strategies for management, managing post-operative opioid at discharge in moderate to high risk patient according to ONIT criteria? Limiting discharge opioid prescription to the expected duration of pain that is severe enough to require opioid. Post-operative coordination of opioid tapering with patient outpatient provider. This is a summary slide, an approach for the use of ONIT classification in perioperative management of patient on preoperative pre opioid. So the first step to classify a patient using ONIT into naive, exposed, or tolerant, as we learn from the previous slides. Then the second step to consider a comorbid condition that may increase the risk, such as psychiatric diagnosis, history, substance dependence, or invasive, to come up with the risk stratification. Third, risk stratified to a low, moderate, and high risk category, as we see here. And then, employee enhanced recovery pathway specific to the risk category. So if you are low, everyone should get education. Everyone should get multimodal analgesia. Um, if you if you belong to the uh, uh, high group, uh, don't forget the consulting pain uh, uh, specialist. These are uh, some extra references for you. Thank you for attention, and please don't forget to subscribe to watch the remaining lectures. Thank you.